As a little child, I tasted the bitter fruits of racism, and I didn't like it. I didn't like seeing those signs. I didn't like when I went to the theater. All of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony, and all the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on old radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. As a student in college, we studied the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. We studied the role in civil disobedience. We studied the great religions of the world. And Andrew Iden would tell you in book one, March book one, we start sitting in black and white college students, black and white high school students. Be sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served. And someone would come up and spit on us. They'll put a lighted cigarette out in our hair or down our bags, pour hot water, hot coffee or hot chocolate on us. Pull us off the lunch kind of stools. We were orderly, peaceful. Many of us accepted nonviolence as a way of life as a way of living. But we were charged with disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace. We got arrested. I went to jail the first time on February 27, 1960. Between 1960 and 1966, I was arrested and jailed 40 times for sitting in, for going on a freedom ride, marching for the right to vote, beaten at a Greyhound bus station in South Carolina, beaten at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, Alabama, and left bloody and unconscious, beaten having a concussion on that bridge in Selma, Alabama on March 7, 1965, a day that became known as Bloody Sunday. But I never became bitter a hostile, never gave up. I never gave in. I kept the faith. And during all these many years, I've tried to keep my eyes on the prize. March, book one. Tell a story of a group of people who stood up together, rested together, beaten together, in jail together. Some of my friends didn't make it. They died. Today, this year, we celebrated, just a few weeks ago, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Back in 1963, August 28, 1963, I was the youngest speaker to march on Washington. And out of the 10 people that spoke that day, I'm the only one still around. So as we write book two and book three, we will tell the whole story, the complete story of a people, of a struggle to make America different, to make America better, and create what we call one people, one family, one house. Because in America, we all live in the same house, the American house. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino or Asian American or Native American. On this little planet, this little spaceship, 
that we call earth, we must learn to live together, as Dr. King was saying, that we will perish as fools. Can I give up? Can I give in? Can I become bitter or hostile? We have to march on with hope, with faith, and with love. We started organizing. We were able to bring more than 250,000 people to March on Washington. And we all had to prepare a speech. I was very young, 23 years old, with all of my hair and a few pounds lighter. I have the pleasure to present to this. When A. Philip Randolph said, I now present to you young John Lewis the National Chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Brother John Lewis. I looked to my right. I saw hundreds and hundreds of young people who had been involved during the early days. I looked straight ahead. I saw this sea of humanity. Then I looked to the left, I saw young black men and young white men up in the trees trying to get a better view. And then I said to myself, well, this is it. And I looked straight ahead again. And something said to me, go for it. And I opened my mouth and I started speaking. We march today for jobs and freedom, but we have nothing to be proud of, for hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here, for they're receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. While we stand here, there are sharecroppers in the Delta of Mississippi who are out in the field working for less than $3 a day, 12 hours a day. While we stand here, there are students in jail on trump up charges. Our brother James Farmer, along with many others, is also in jail. We come here today with a great sense of misgiving. It is true that we support the administration's civil rights bill. We support it with great reservation, however. Unless, unless Tile 3 is put in this bill, there's nothing to protect the young children and old women who must face police jobs and fire hoses in the South while they engage in peaceful demonstration. In its present form, this bill will not protect the citizen of Danville, Virginia, who must live in constant fear of a police state. It will not protect the hundreds and thousands of people who have been arrested upon Trump charges. What about the three young men, Snickfield's secretary in America's Georgia, who faced a death penalty for engaging in peaceful protests. As it stands now, the voting section of this bill will not help the thousands of black people who want to vote. It will not help the citizens of Mississippi, of Alabama, and Georgia who are qualified to vote for lack of sixth grade education. One man, one vote is the African cry. It is our tool. It must be ours. We must have legislation that will protect the Mississippi sharecropper, who is put off of his farm because he dared to register to vote. We need a bill that will provide for the homeless and starving people of this nation. We need a bill that will ensure the equality of a maid who earns $5 a week in a home of a family whose total income is $100,000 a year. We must have a good FEPC bill. My friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. But by and large, American politics is dominated by politicians who build their career on immoral compromise and ally themselves with open form of political, economic, and social exploitation. There are exceptions, of course. We salute those. But what political leader can stand up and say, my party is a party of principles? 
for the party of Kennedy is also the party of Eastland. The party of Javis is also the party of Goldwater. Where is our party? Where is the political party that will make it unnecessary to march on Washington? Where is the political party that will make it unnecessary to march in the streets of Birmingham? Where is the political party that will protect the citizen of Albany, Georgia? Do you know that in Albany, Georgia, nine of our leaders have been indicted, not by the Dixocrats, but by the federal government for peaceful protest. But what did the federal government do when Albany deputy sheriff beat Attorney C.B. King and left him half dead? What did the federal government do when local police official kicked and assaulted the pregnant wife of Slater King and she lost her baby? Those who have said be patient and wait, we must say that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We're tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom, and we want it now. We do not want to go to jail, but we will go to jail if this, this is the price we must pay for love, brotherhood, and true peace. I appeal to all of you to get in this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. We must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. For in the Delta of Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, in the Black Belt of Alabama, in Harlem, in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and all over this nation, the black masses are on the march for jobs and freedom. <laughs> They're talking about slow down and stop. We will not stop. All of the forces of Eastland Barnett, Wallace, and Thurman will not stop this revolution. If we do not get meaningful legislation out of this Congress, the time will come when we will not confine our march into Washington. We will march through the South, through the streets of Jackson, through the streets of Danville, through the streets of Cambridge, through the streets of Birmingham. But we will march with the spirit of love and with the spirit of dignity that we have shown here today. By the forces of our demand, our determination, and our numbers, we shall splinter the segregated South into a thousand pieces and put them together in the image of God and democracy. We must say, wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop, and we will not and cannot be patient. We line up in twos to walk from Selma to Montgomery. We'll march in today to dramatize to the nation dramatized to the world that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blackville area, denied the right to vote. I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear backpacks. I thought I was going to get arrested and go to jail, so in this backpack, I wanted to have something to eat. I had one apple and one orange. I had two books, I had toothpaste and a toothbrush. But we understood while we were walking through the streets of Selma that the sheriff of Selma and Dallas County had requested that all white men over the age of 21 to come down to the courthouse that Saturday night to be deputized to become part of his posse. We just kept 
walking. We come to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Down below, we see a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. We saw all of this water down below in the Alabama River. Jose Williams said to me, John, can you swim? I said, no, Jose, what about you? He said, a little. I said, well, that's too much water in this river for us to jump. We must go straight ahead. A man by the name of John Cloud identified himself and said, I'm Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. Be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful march. This is an unlawful march. It will not be allowed to continue. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. Disperse and return to your homes or to your church. I said, Major, may I have a word? He said, there will be no word. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. He said, troopers advance. Troopers here, advance. They came toward us. Beating us with nightsticks. Tramping us with horses. Releasing tear gas. I was the first person to be hit. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to down that bridge. I thought it was my last nonviolent protest. And all these many years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge to the church. I do recall being in the church they asked me to say something to the audience. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to vote. 